so good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, depending on where you are in, in the world. Uh, my name is Christian Morgner. Um, I'm one of the conveners of the uh, BSA's theory group, and I would like to welcome you to today's event. Um, this e event is dedicated to an influential sociological thinker, Karl Marx, um, and it's part of a series of events where we want to revisit sociological thinkers from the perspective of contemporary issues and debates. In particular, the, talk, the talks on debating established narratives of great thinkers or classics, but also relate the social thinker to contemporary issues like race, globalization, rapid social change. To deliver this agenda, we will focus on the recent publication by Professor Marcelo Musto called The Last Years of Karl Marx. So it's this lovely book here. Um, and we hope that these discussions uh, will demonstrate the relevance and usefulness of sociological theory for sociology on the whole. Today's event consists of four eminent scholars who have widely published um, and conducted research on Marxist theory in general. So let me briefly introduce them. So first and foremost, uh, Marcelo Muster um, is professor of sociology at York University in Canada. He received his BA and MA in political science and PhD degree in philosophy and politics from the University of Naples. Um, he joined the uh, Department of Sociology at York University in Canada in 2014 and was promoted to full professor in 2020. Um, he has held uh, visiting fellowships at many universities around the globe, um, including notable examples like the University of Pisa, University of Helsinki, and Riccio University. Uh, professor Musto is editor of the book series Marx, Engels, Marxisms at Palgrave Macmillan and Critiques and Alternatives to Capitalism at Rutledge. He has edited a considerable number of books on Karl Marx, including publications like Another Marx, Early Manuscripts to International with Bloomsbury Academic, The Marx Revival, Key Concepts and New Interpretations with Cambridge University Press, Rethinking Alternatives with Marx, Economy, Ecology and Migration with Palgrave Macmillan. And of course, he has authored the book that is the center of today's discussion, The Last Years of Karl Marx. So that's this book over here. Professor Muster will be joined by three eminent scholars for today's event, which I will present in alphabetical order. Um, Kevin B. Anderson is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with courtesy appointments in feminist studies and political science. He is author of books like Lenin, Hegel, and Western Marxism, Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, Marx at the Margins or Nationalism and Ethnicity in Non-Western Societies, and dialectics of revolution, Hegel, Marxism, and its critics through a lens of race, gender, and colonialism. He writes regularly in For New Politics, the International Marxist Humanist um, on Marxism, and on international politics and radical movements in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. Professor Imani Banjiri is also from the Department of Sociology at the University of York. She studied in Calcutta and earned her PhD and MA. Uh, with her thesis completed in 1988 with the title, The Politics of Representation, the Study of Class and Class Struggle in the uh, Political Theater of West Bengal. Since then, she has continued her work on areas of Marxist, feminist, and anti-racist theory. She's especially focused on reading colonial discourse through Karl Marx concepts of ideology and putting together a reflexive analysis of gender, race, and class. Her publications include books like Thinking Through, Essays in Marxism, Feminism, and Anti-Racism, Democracy and Democracy, Essays on Nationalism, Gender, and Ideology, or the Ideological Condition Selected Essays on History, Race, and Gender. In addition to her academic research, she has also published a number of activist poetry, for instance, her book, um, Colored Pictures, Teaches Children About Confronting Racism. David Smith is professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Kansas. Before joining the University of Kansas in 1990, he studied sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and economics at the University of California, Berkeley. His works are at the intersection between political sociology, political psychology, and political economy. That interest and his background in social theory has led him to publish on a great variety of topics like on prejudice and intolerance, authority and authoritarianism, the Holocaust, the Rwandan genocide in 1994, on charisma and crisis, capitalism and labor. He also contributed uh, Marx, making Marx's theory more available with his publication on, with his publication, Marx Capital, an illustrated introduction, which I really enjoyed, which blends the genre of comic with academic publication. 
So thank you all for attending today's event. Um, as Doug mentioned already in the outline, today's event will last for about 90 minutes. Um, in the first half of the event, Professor Muster will open with a statement on his book, uh, which is followed by replies um, by the other discussants. After that, we will open the general discussion so that you can freely join the continuing debate. Please note that today's event will be recorded and made available on the website of the British Sociological Association. So if you don't want your image to be made available, please use the chat function for the discussion, uh, which I'm going to monitor. So that's for me for today. Uh, Professor Muster, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Christian. Thank you to Christian Morgner and to British Sociological Association for the invitation. And um, of course, to my colleagues, David, Kevin, and Imani, who were so kind to take their time to discuss um, the last years of Karl Marx with me. Um, I will be today in the, in the double function of being a little bit the master of ceremonies and then also the author of the book. So I will try to um, quickly introduce um, um, some information about Marx also because I've been told that we are not in front of an audience with specialists, but we want to like set the discussion with some information. And, um, and then later, of course, I will uh, respond to questions, criticism, and you know, we decided to have uh, two rounds, seven minutes each the first and about five minutes each the second. And then we will, of course, have a um, question and answer. So um, I'm very much looking forward to um, discussing the book with you. So I initially wanted to start from um, who was Marx in the 80s, who was Marx at the end of his life, but actually, I feel that I always have to try to explain who was Marx before the 80s, because usually we have this idea that Karl Marx was always a very known person, very successful with, um, I don't know, millions of people following his ideas, like in the 20th century. It was not the case for most of his life. And... Um, you know, if we want to go very quickly over the um, different decades of Marx's life, we can see that he was um, a very brilliant student in the 40s and then also journalist, but um, for, you know, many political issues in the end, he was forced to, to go to, to London to exile after, you know, Paris, Brussels, so the 40s. Um, was a very turbulent decade for Karl Marx before he moved to, to London. And um, the 50s, perhaps, this was the decade of um, um, dramatic isolation for Marx, because this is after the counter-revolution of 1849. So um, I wrote another book, um, Another Marx, that is also a sort of intellectual biography of this period. And we can count on the fingers of... Um, of um, perhaps only one end, um, the kind of, you know, real connections and, you know, um, friends and political uh, contacts that Marx had in the 50s. There were very few people close to Marx in this um, long decade of uh, counter-revolution and also um, a study of um, um, political economy that, of course, changed with the a crisis in 1857 and then with the writing of the Grundrisse. The 60s are something different because Marx became in 1864 for almost a decade until 1872, one of the most important leader, if not, you know, the most important, surely the most important personalities for some years of the first international. So that gave Marx centrality. And this centrality, um, in the socialist uh, arena became particularly visible after 1871, so after the, the, the Paris Commune. Um, this also brings me to another um, um, little parenthesis that I want to open, like, you know, we know many books about Marx, but usually some of these books were not books, but were just manuscripts. And I think that um, a lot of what we are going to discuss today will be focused on this, on the differentiation between what Marx published, what Marx left in a sort of unfinished, incomplete form. And um, some of the most known or sold or debated books of Marx are 
um, unpublished manuscript by Marx. For example, the very well-known 1844 manuscript, also known as the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844, or the German Ideology, or the Grundrisse that I just mentioned, or volume two and three of Capital that were edited and published by Engels after Marx's death, or the theories on surplus value or the critique of Gotha program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Marx wrote many things. Again, he was a journalist for almost two decades, if we put together all uh, these years, um, during which he was writing for newspaper, including very prestigious and important one like the New York Tribune in the United States, and wrote, published several books, for example, the Holy Family in 1845, the um, philosophy, uh, Misery of Philosophy in 1847, or the Communist Manifesto that he published in 1848 with Engels, but that started to circulate actually only in the 70s after the Paris Commune. And then, of course, Capital, that was his um, masterpiece published in 1867 before another book that very few individuals known knew and this was the 1859 critique of political economy so i'm just saying this because <clears throat> we want to make sure that marx is not um, um, a very well-known person a leader that is always um, that was always followed by i don't know political parties like the spd the social democracy in germany this is for example the, the reason why marx wrote the critique on the Gotha program. And um, I'm sure that um, my colleagues will touch this uh, point and we will discuss this later. So now I can go to what has been usually considered the last phase of Marx's life and uh, what is surely, um, in my opinion, the most unknown part of, uh, of Marx's life. And when we say life here, we are talking about the intellectual biography, the development of his ideas. And uh, for um, many reasons, I will take one extra minute to discuss about this um, at the end of my introduction. Um, almost all the biographers of Marx or um, uh, the most important scholars of Marx, they consider this period a sort of slow agony or a period in which the activity of Marx was limited just to a few articles. I'm talking about the end of the International, 1872, and the year in which Marx died, 1883. So in this 11 years, usually considered the last decade of Marx. So why this Marx was forgotten? So this might be one question that we should try to address today. Um, in my opinion, there are many reasons for this. First of all, because after um, um, you know, the end of World War II, when Marxism really became the most important, I don't know, political, uh, philosophical ideology and doctrine in many uh, European countries, you know, with the communist and socialist parties, trade unions, after, of course, what happened before in Soviet Union in 1917, and then parallel to the end of World War II in China. So in this period, there is another Marx, because this word, Karl Marx, this name Karl Marx has, in my opinion, different meanings according to a certain uh, part of the world or a certain period, right? So a Marx in um, 1970s is not Karl Marx of the 1930s because of all this manuscript that were published, for example, and that changed the profile of Marx. So another Marx is at the center of the debate and this Marx is the so-called young Marx. So the Marx that is writing about alienation, the Marx that was very useful to criticize Soviet Union, Stalinism, the Marx that was loved in Paris by existentialists, not only them, of course. So there is um, an hegemony in the discussion in the debate about Marx that in my opinion lasts at least for, for two decades. And as I mentioned before, these books, the books, the manuscript, the uncompleted manuscript that Marx wrote in the 1840s, the philosophical manuscript of 1844, the German ideology, these were <clears throat> the most discussed and sold um, volumes, and not only in Marxism, but also in um, university courses in you know, Italy, uh, Germany, 
friends, etc. <clears throat> so this is one reason. Of course, this is of course not the only reason, but you know, connected to this, there is a debate that um, divided this young Marx to the so-called major Marx, but this distinction is um, basically made between 1844 and 1867. So this last Marx is completely forgotten. And also the, you know, the period of the international that is very important for Marx because it's not only learning by reading his books, but also with you know, political activities and with the political uh, confrontation and discussion with other socialism at this time, these things are left in the background, if not forgotten at all. There is one more reason uh, that I would like to mention in the last um, minute, two minutes and a half that I have left, that um, there were no writings available until a certain time. So if we look at the Marx Engels collected works, the Marx Engels uh, Berk, the German uh, edition, etc., cetera, um, there are many volumes in the 40s, all this um, um, manuscript of the early writings, et cetera, many volumes in the 50s, the journalism for the New York Tribunes, the political writings of the international in the 60s, et cetera. But the published materials in this decade, 1872, 1883, were very um, um, few, right? So many people believed, I'm talking about the old Marxologists, the old generation, that Marx had done very little in this period. And um, this is not true for, um, you know, at least a few decades, in particularly after a very well-known scholar has published um, uh, Crather, Lauren Crather, The Ethnological Notebooks of Marx. So this was a big revolution in the understanding of what Marx did in this period, like in the 60s and the 70s, the Grundrisse started to circulate and also helped the readers of Marx to, to have another chapter, another missing chapter of the you know, development of his ideas. And um, of course, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, the new edition, the new historical edition of Marx and Engels that has been republished after 1998 is also helping us a lot in the past years with many new notebooks of excerpt. And you know, I'm sure that my colleagues, David in particular, will talk about this in a few minutes. Um, so now that we have these writings about Marx that were not available you know, after World War II, for example, um, I believe that there is a, a poor scholarship when we see, once again, books, intellectual biographies, or you know, theoretical analysis of Marx that exclude this important elaboration made by Marx in this period. And from this point of view, a completely different take is the you know, groundbreaking book written um, a decade ago by, by Kevin Anderson, Marx at the Margin, that takes a completely different approach that was very useful and was also translated into many languages because it helped us to read Marx also uh, um, you know, in full and with this important last decade full of new elaborations as we will discuss during this uh, talk. But there is also one final thing that, you know, that now that we have the writings, we also have to understand that Marx um, uh, notebooks and published materials, they are very, very difficult to read. Marx is reading some of these texts in different languages. There is a lot of Russian, there are notes that are written in several languages. So of course we cannot pretend that you, you know, every activist, every militant, every student at university is able to read these documents. That's why we welcome and each of us, um, Kevin, David, and I in particular are working on preparing new anthologies or making this Texas um, available. And then, of course, there is the wonderful work made by Imani that has been working on some of the topics touched by the last marks for many, many years. So I will end this um, introduction here, but I want to end this conversation, this introduction here, by saying that some of the topics touched by Marx in this last decade, touched by Marx in the last years of his life. In my book, I only covered the period 1881, 1883, 
but um, some of the um, subject on which Marx devoted his energies at the end of his life are also um, very useful for us today. So are also topics like, I don't know, migration, like um, colonialism, like um, um, history and uh, socialist revolution, not only made in Western societies that are very, very useful for us, that are often at the center of the political debate. And this is one more reason why the last Marx, the late Marx has still a lot to say. And now I will leave the floor to my to my colleagues. Thanks. So the first one is uh, David. Please, David. So thank you, Marcello, and hi to everyone. I know a few of the people here, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Um, as Marcello just told us, and as he explains very well in his outstanding book, Marx's last decade often appears to be an arid desert. I mean, his writings up until that point uh, were spectacular, whether people agree with them or disagree with them, culminating in volume one of Capital in 1867. And Marx lived just over 15 years after that first volume appeared. So in the very final years of his life, Marx published little, if anything. Um, to the extent that he was working in that decade, what people know of his work is primarily the manuscripts that Engels put together and called volume two after Marx had died in 1883. So is this in fact uh, a, a period of um, basically decline in the way that so many people have said? Uh, I personally feel that the final decade of Marx's life and the final few years of his life were among his most creative. And that is reflected not in publications, but in the manuscripts that he left behind. Marx took about 10,000 pages of manuscript notes in very tiny handwriting, remarkably tiny handwriting in that last decade of his life. And some people have speculated that he was simply um, losing his focus, that he was um, interested in a range of things that were uh, unconnected to his lifelong project. But uh, I'm confident that is not the case. And that in fact, Marx was working on capital for the entire 15 years uh, of the remainder of his life after volume one appeared. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, let me back into that point. There is actually one text from the uh, 1880s that is extraordinarily famous, and this is by Engels. Um, shortly after Marx had died, Engels rummaged through Marx's papers and found, among other things, a massive set of notes taken on an important book by Lewis Henry Morgan. And Engels was excited, and he quickly wrote a small book that has been world famous ever since. And this is The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Now, this is a, a major contribution, but I think it's also a misleading contribution. And the problem lies in the word origin. The implication that Engels leaves us is that Marx was trying to trace the prehistory of the state and the family. And the reality, if Engels had by this point more carefully read the whole of what Marx wrote about Morgan, if he had carefully read what Marx wrote about Sir Henry Maine's important book from the same period and a range of other books by Kovalevsky and Fear and Lubbock and Friedlander and, and myriad others, he would have understood that what Marx was trying to understand was non-capitalist social relations. Those non-capitalist social relations still prevailed in most corners of the world in 1880 and 1881 and 1882. So Marx was certainly interested in the origin of class and the family and the state, but he was most fundamentally interested in the world that capital was expanding into. Marx was writing what we call volumes two and three of capital, particularly volume two. Volume two, tends not to interest people as much as it, as it could. Uh, volume one focuses on the production process. Everybody um, who has an interest in Marx has at least dipped a toe into volume one of capital. Volume two has the forbidding title circulation process and circulation sounds dull and bland, but in reality, Marx was talking about the formation of the world market in the most important manuscript in volume two. Um, which Marx began to write in 1878. Engels called it Manuscript 8. 
Marx relaxed the assumption that capitalism was a static system, and he began to look at global capital accumulation directly for the very first time. He was reading about non-Western cultures, non-capitalist cultures at that very moment. And I, I'll spare you the details, but it's clear to me from years of research on Marx's so-called ethnological manuscripts, which will appear before long in a fully English, uh, fully edited translation. Um, it's clear to me that Marx was trying to understand the world that global capital accumulation entails. If capitalism is spilling over from its, its origins in Europe to the entire remainder of the world, the consequences uh, in all of the different parts of the world depend on the character of social relations in all of those different places. So Marx studied Algeria, India, Indonesia, Latin America, uh, the matrilineal belt of cultures in Central Africa, and many other cultures in this period. Marcello does a particularly good job of delineating what Marx had to say about Russia in this period. But if we dig, dig deeper into the so-called ethnological notebooks, which are notebooks on Lewis Henry Morgan, Sir Henry Maine, and, and others, we find that Marx is not just collecting details, he is actually trying to understand social structure in a fundamental way. And I will close with a brief characterization of what Marx felt he had found. Engels, when he wrote about Marx's notes on Morgan, um, was preoccupied with some of the things that Marx said about marriage and uh, strange phrases like syndiasmian and punaluan might resonate for those of you who have read The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. But marriage was a, a tangential issue for Morgan. Morgan was trying to understand the character of what we can call clan society. The world over, people have been organized in various ways that have been called tribes, um, and, and a number of other terms have been used. But Marx believed that Morgan had, by means of analysis of dozens and dozens of cultures, that Morgan had identified a structure that had in all likelihood migrated around the globe as people migrated around the globe. And Marx believed that his work up until that point, which had focused on class society, should be supplemented by attention to what we can call clan society. This is a, a barbaric simplification, but if we look at the issue of origins, we can say that what Marx was perceiving was a transition from clan to class. That transition took a number of forms that he delineated. In some cases, it involved agriculture. In other cases, it involved herding. Um, the Irish case, which was documented by the Irish themselves in the eighth and ninth centuries is a classic instance. And Marx paid very careful attention to that. In any event, uh, leaving the the fine details to one side, I'll say that there are a great many fine details. And if Engels had looked at Marx's manuscript on Sir Henry Maine's book, as well as what Marx had written about Morgan, he would discover that this very important, massive manuscript on Maine, which, involved, which has many direct comments uh, by Marx himself, is a sustained disagreement with Maine. Maine uh, represented what anthropologists have traditionally called the patriarchal theory of social origins, the belief that the nuclear family was the original nucleus of social relations. Marx felt that Maine had radically misunderstood um, early society and societies of clan, of clan types still existing in the world. And so Marx's notes on Maine are a sustained defense of Morgan's views against Maine's views. And that defense led Marx into discussion of gender um, in ways that Kevin, for example, has discussed very well in Marx at the margins, and, and really myriad other things too, including um, the origins of patriarchy, the, the prevalence of different forms of patriarchy worldwide, and, and, and myriad, myriad other phenomena that are, that are related. In any event, um, we were given seven minutes. I'm sure I've already exceeded that, so I will put the remainder of what I was planning to say on pause and, and hand the microphone to Kevin Anderson. 
Thank you all. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Kevin, seven minutes for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad to be here among such good company, both the other speakers and some of the names that I recognize and hope to have dialogue with them and others as we continue. Uh, yeah, I think the kind of thing Marx is doing at the end of his life, moving his focus, uh, as Hans Peter Horstick said over 40 years ago when he edited the Kovalevsky notes, moving his gaze eastward and southward. And of course, I woke up this morning to this horrible news uh, of the coup in Sudan, which, uh, you know, along with the uh, Taliban victory in Afghanistan, is just, you know, possibly a sign that. We're moving into a counter-revolutionary period, you know, that you know certainly United States Trump is not over with, but also how uh, the locus, at least, of global politics uh, remains to, to to a great extent in in the global South, even though it lacks the economic weight of uh, the the more de industrially developed countries. So this is a good way to transition into the the late Marx. And I want to begin a little bit, you know, with what David was talking about, because speaking to an, I'm sure some, not all the audience are, you know, super familiar with all the work on the late Marx that's been done over the past three or four decades. So let me just start with what I think is known, which is, uh, as David mentioned, Engels' book on gender in the family, which is based on Marx's own notes on Morgan. This may be, Engels' book may be the most widely read book by either Marx or Engels. Uh, it's certainly very, very widely read, continues to be. So, uh, and there've been lots of critiques of it, but within Marxism, uh, there were there've been a couple of critiques of Engels over the years, the one by Lukash on the dialectic, the one by, uh, the one from those who, disagreed with his editing of Capital. Uh, and, but Raya Denevskaya, my mentor, and Heather Brown, my student, have uh, developed uh, a third critique of Engels, as David was talking about, that Engels truncated in various ways uh, the argument of Marx, which is much more subtle on gender in the family. The second thing it's known, not quite as well known, but certainly it's in mo most of the Marx readers, like McClellan have at least an excerpt of this, Marx's letters to, to Vera Zazulich, letters and drafts uh, to Vera Zazulich and a couple other texts uh, on Russia and the possibility of the Russian village uh, being a basis for possibly a modern communist uh, revolution if it could link up with the proletarian revolution in the West, as he said in his last published writing, the uh, preface to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto written in, I think, February, 1882. Uh, so I, I want to, you know, talk about Mar Marcello's book, um, which for the first time carefully surveys the whole of the last few years of Marx. Because what others have done is focus on, you know, what we thought was maybe the most interesting parts or whatever. But Marcello has tried to uh, very usefully and carefully survey uh, the whole. So of course. What David was talking about, the ethnological notebooks, you know, broadly conceived, which is, I think David said, 10,000 pages uh, of material, uh, certainly many thousands. Uh, and they cover all the different societies that, that David mentioned. From, uh, we could also mention Latin America. We'd also mention indigenous populations uh, of North and South America. Uh, and uh, a lot of that is on gender. Uh, there are also the debates with the Russians that, that I just mentioned. Uh, Marcello surveys that as well, the possibility of revolution in Russia, how that fit in to proletarian revolution in the West in Marx's eyes. Uh, but these were not the only things Marx was, was doing as interesting as they were, uh, because Marcello points out that in 1880, there's a heavy involvement in the French Socialist Party helping to draft, I don't think it was called the Socialist Party yet, uh, try, helping to draft their program. There's also that wonderful Enquete Ouvrière, which is I think the first example of a push poll because the questions push the workers 
toward a socialist consciousness. It's not simply an ordinary survey, but what? how could Marx have done such something ordinary? Uh, the notes on Adolf Wagner, 1879, one of the core texts in his critique of political economy. And then these massive notes on European history based on a book by Schlosser uh, that go on and on and on for thousands and thousands of pages that I think are part of that 10,000 David was talking about. And then notes on various scientific and mathematical topics. So Mar Marcello for the first time surveys all of this uh, and, uh, and uh, it's gonna be very useful to me in, in the book I'm working on, on, on the late Marx and revolution uh, that, that I've drafted a good part of. Uh, but I, I also wanna say what the book is not, the book is not a, it's called, it's, it's an intellectual biography, but it's a little more than that because some material is presented on Marx's health and his family relations. So it's not just an intellectual biography, but unlike, you know, those like Sperber or Stedman Jones, it doesn't, you know, get into the archives of, you know, this and that. Uh, it isn't a biography in that sense. And of course, one of the problems with these biog biographers, is I think most of them agree with, Fou whether they would admit it or not, agree with Foucault's statement that Marx is like a fish who swims in the water of the 19th century, but then flop, flops and starts to drown when you take him out of the 19th century, uh, because those biographies don't really grasp usually the theoretical issues, which uh, Marcello, of course, grasps uh, quite well. But it's not really a theoretical study either. Uh, uh, it is really an intellectual biography. It's kind of a survey, but with a theoretical bent that, of course, has that much better grasp of theory. Uh, and, and some of what I'm saying here. I'm um, publishing a review of the book in New Politics, or at least I hope they're publishing it. Uh, they, they, they invited it. Um, the, uh, I guess have to, I want to end with two questions from Marcello. Is there, a, does your book have a thesis beyond uh, the general observation that Marx is an original, creative, and non dogmatic thinker who keeps, you know, rethinking stuff at, at a general level? And secondly, on the Russia business, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not satisfied completely with the the way in which you delink the discussion of Russian communism and the communal villages and the possibility of revolution uh, from other pre-capitalist societies. Because I want to underline that in the notes on India, he revisits the Sepoy uprising again with great enthusiasm great emotional enthusiasm, he burns through those notes. The notes on, uh, the, the main notes that uh, David was talking about, these are mainly about Ireland. These are about pre-colonial Ireland and the gender and communal social structures. And I find it hard to believe that if Marx was thinking about that as a basis for revolution in Russia, he wasn't also thinking about it as a basis for revolution in India, Ireland, the Algerian notes, I think, more almost say that uh, and link it a little bit to the Paris Commune. So that, that's the, uh, there are a few other issues, but that, that's the main one where, where I think we can have some, some additional conversation today. Uh, and I'd like to hear from Marcello on, on those points. Thank you. Kevin, many thanks. And um, now it is the time for Imani. I cannot see her but I know that she's there, Imani. Yes, and thank you for inviting me to join you. And I want to congratulate you, Marcello, for creating not just an intellectual biography, as Kevin said, but a very finely shaded portrait of Marx, who had immense commitment to scholarship, to politics, to revolution is combined with the vulnerability of being human and sharing the joys and ills of life. And he becomes a person, a whole one in his own right and doesn't have to be like the granite sculpture, which is in Highgate where we put all these kinds of garlands on him. So thanks for smashing the, uh, the, the granite aspect of Marx's uh, 
uh, social view by others socially. Now I want to um, not talk so much. I have no great scholarship that you seem to share on the later writings, not a direct one at least, but you know, ones that are available here and there, beginning with uh, Hobbesbaum's book on pre-capitalist economic formation, Theodore Shanin's work on late Marx, and Sevran work on the, on the uh, Mor Morgan uh, ancient society. But it's not, what interests me about your book is the political implications of what you have actually brought out to us. And I think that it's really important to remember that um, uh, Marx has to be freed from the stereotypical second internationalist or Leninist version of him used extensively by communist and socialist parties and scholars of the left. And it should be noted that though Lenin didn't have the opportunity to read much Marx, those who came along after him and wrote a great, read a great many things, which uh, you read even much more than that, but they didn't take the trouble of learning from it and altering their approach to what is Marx. So the Marx uh, that they had shared um, equally between supporters and detractors, the view of him as a positivist, scientificist, economistic thinker who thinks that uh, there'll be an immediate and uh, or there'll be an inevitable move from capitalism to, to communist revolution as though the um, this law-like understanding of, of uh, social transformation that they invented out of Marx and probably abetted a bit by Engels that uh, communist revolution would be a mere function of capital structural movement. And this approach um, is really quite detrimental to the uh, work on uh, new ways of perceiving Marx. So I think that what you have done, uh, that, uh, that this uh, approach to Marx, which automatically spells out into a vanguard party, an organization of democratic centralism, which becomes ever more centralist rather than democratic, um, and, and gets involved either with bourgeois politics or an authoritarian top-down political chain of command has been broken by the work that it can be by using your book, not that people always will, but it makes us rethink uh, how we've been doing our communism. Now, freeing Marx from these various reificatory forms of reading, I feel that your text tries to restore Marx to his historical materialism and reveals the rich possibilities uh, still alive and well uh, from his social and political thought, particularly from the last years of his life. And uh, coming from India as I do and being involved in some ways with communist politics through my life, I feel that your book has helped us to further our challenge to the two-stage theory of communist revolution. The, the reader is seriously prompted to ask questions of it regarding class struggle and communist revolution and the consequence of the acceptance of such a theory because it causes fundamental problems in conceptualizing um, the organization of any revolutionary movement. And this happens no less in industrialized country or in less industrialized countries and formerly colonized ones, but actually also harms the industrialized capitalist parts by creating an impression of an undoability of revolution, both in the first and the third world. 
So this two-stage theory, which valorizes capitalism for its super development of productive forces and creating the industrial proletariat, has actually fed into somewhat racialized and centralized common sense, or orientalized common sense regarding the authenticity and effectiveness of anti-imperialist politics in the third world. And I want to mention that some of the writings on movement of history done by authors such as Perry Anderson in his um, book on lineages of the absolute state or even the passage from antiquity to feudalism or Barrington Moore's book on democracy and dictatorship and so on, on which people communists like us were raised, actually influenced us to think that there was an Eastern and Western Marxism, an Eastern way of doing politics and the Western way. And this wasn't helped also by writers like Bill Warren, who worked on Africa and talked about the gift that colonialism brought to those parts of the world and put them back in history. Marx may have said it in his own time, uh, but 150 years later or so, others were repeating the same thing. So I think that this re revision in the best sense of the word of Marx that your book has is a very important one for people like us. And uh, so, yes, Marx is to some extent himself responsible to uh, uh, creating this enthusiasm for talking so uh, for capitalism by talking so extensively uh, and vivaciously about the communists in the communist manifesto about the bourgeoisie and their productive forces development. But, uh, and, uh, and, but Marcello provides evidence that Marx had not stopped about revolutionary social transformations ever in his life. In his last years, he was increasingly coming to cons consider other types of social formations as possible revolutionary spaces, providing necessary subjectivities and agencies for making fundamental social transformation, nor perhaps in historicizing and specificizing capitalism did Marx think that capitalism in the well, in uh, let's say advanced capitalist countries was the only model uh, or socialism there were the only models that we would have had. So this text does quite a bit of model breaking out of the, uh, you know, from, from the past. And, uh, and I want to further remark that the, about the perils of two-stage theory, which through the communist movements in countries such as India and China into a great quandary, not the least, because they had to engage in anti-colonial and anti-capitalist struggles at the same time. But the two-stage theory taught, taught them that their own productive cases, classes, namely peasantry and small commodity producers, could not provide them with the revolutionary agent, the right agency, and, uh, and the circumstances under which they could become uh, engage in a task of revolution. Now, the class that was there, the agriculturally productive class that we had no use for, the industrial proletariat that we know need stereotypically in that formulation was largely non-existent. But non-existent. So in India, this resulted in an indefinite deferral of the communist revolution, and that continues to this day. So the Communist Party of India later then lent all its support in supporting the bourgeois state in the first instance under before undertaking the revolutionary task and joined the planned economy of India where the state itself took a role in uh, 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 spearheading capitalism in the agricultural sector and uh, joining with the national bourgeoisie or developing national bourgeoisie so that we could have a proletarian class work. 
Now to the, make this point uh, a little clearer, I'll just say this, that um, Marx's research as outlined by Marcello on Russia, uh, on other parts of the non-Western, non-European uh, world, uh, he's uh, made it, uh, uh, and his reading of, for example, left populist philosophers and novelists like Chernyshevsky, and you have not mentioned, for example, Goncharov's Oblomov. I don't think Marx was, would have had the time to read that, but later writers in that tradition, uh, Lenin's own book on capitalist development in Russia, all kind of, um, you know, aid us in believing what you have said that uh, Marx changed to some extent his uh, views on revolutionary possibilities across the world, perhaps because he felt that the knowledges of productive forces that are needed for revolution can be shared across the world. They don't all have to, as you pointed out, um, undergo the same trials and tribulations, but skip a stage or two or incorporate the knowledges of these countries, of the developed countries, into doing what it is that uh, a new communist project. And uh, so, but yet at the same time, the Opshina's life, as you pointed out, is not an uh, idyllic one. It's not an ima imagined pastoral paradise. But however, what you point out is the importance of such collectivist, uh, productive property owning relations in, when inserted in the capitalist, anti capitalist movements. For example, the Zapatista project and some others could become an aid to creating um, a socialist revolution or a communist revolution, which would have a fused protagonist, which would be industrial proletariat and the agricultural uh, land, uh, land, uh, land workers and owners. So uh, I just need to finish by saying that uh, you have actually uh, done a very important service to, uh, to, uh, to actually moving our attention from a kind of a fixed um, uh, uh, approach to the um, proletariat as the industrial male white worker. And it is kind of um, brought us to the, also to the question of not modernization, industrial technology, but to the question of land and land grab, forms of primitive accumulation going on now, which are creating innumerable forced uh, mi global migration destroying territorial sovereignty and all modes of collectivist production and lives. So I just want to end by saying that um, uh, we really need to remember that uh, Marx by the end of his life cannot be categorized as either Occidental thinker or an Orientalist thinker. Marx's position as an Occidental thinker has prevented many new nationalist, liberationist, indigenous, and other movements from being able to feel that they can take part of him because he is an old white man and had a Eurocentric worldview. But what we have got out of this book that you made is actually that he broke through the barriers of this um, uh, you Occidentalism, Euros, and uh, Orientalism, Eurocentrism, and uh, you know, nativist nationalism, and opened up a way of thinking about communism, which is truly international. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imani, and um, thanks to all of you for the generous um, words that you 
just um, mentioned about my book, about my work. I have to be very fast because our time is limited. And uh, this second round, we have to try to, uh, you know, um, be a little bit more concise so that we can have time to discuss with the audience with possible questions or remarks that we are getting from those who are listening to us live. Then there will also be um, uh, YouTube um, since this conversation is recorded. So I wanted to say, wanted to explain what did uh, Marx do in this uh, period, but actually all of you did it so well. And, um, you know, I don't have to go through this. And um, I'm also grateful to what Kevin said, because actually um, this question, Kevin, of um, uh, having a division between a biography and a theoretical work is also something that I wanted to avoid. And I wanted to avoid this also because I wanted to reach uh, a wide audience of readers. And I also always believed that uh, in order to understand Marx's ideas, you have to know uh, a lot about uh, his life. Last but not least, to understand you know, the, um, um, the level and the main characteristic of this uh, manuscript that David described so well for us in order to understand if they were written for Marx himself, if they were his final thinking, if he was extremely skeptical. So that's how I've always been reading Marx correspondence or the notebooks, etc. So what I wanted to do is try to give a full profile of Marx in this uh, period and um, avoid to, to make this separation that um, um, Kevin, you you represented. Um, I also I'm also interested in um, in your question, Kevin, which is you know the um, uh, the one more directed uh, to me. So what was my thesis in uh, in this book? And actually, everything that is Mani has said, like I've done the philological work, and Mani has done the political work because she did it so well. I could be I could say a few things at the top of what she said, but this was my goal, like to represent that Marx is not um, fixated only with, uh, with, uh, with class, that he did not have an economicistic view, a deterministic view, or the, uh, it was not an Eurocentric. So my thesis is very similar to the work, Kevin, that, that you have done. And I think that his money was particularly good in talking about, as she said, the political implication of not you know my book but you know this reading of marx that we have been doing together in uh, in the in the past years for you know as imani said organizing the revolution for the idea of marx communism etc i just wanted to read um, a couple of things from the book or more than read perhaps mentioned but i was particularly excited when i read that marx was like kovaleski very critical about you know the um, colonial occupation. Marx is also using the um, study of Kowalewski on uh, uh, French press and in Algeria, etc. But he was he was critical of some aspects of Kowalewski's historical account, because according to Marx, Kowalewski wrongly projected some European idea into you know non-European context. For example, in India. So Marx is very clear that we cannot. Uh, skeptical about transferring, you know, interpretative categories from completely different historical and geographical contexts. So this is very useful, um, not only to make justice to Marx, but also for us today in coming days. And Imani also mentioned um, one other important point of uh, this uh, studies that I conducted. So um, the relation between Marx and Chernyshevsky because Marx had been studied so many <clears throat> hundreds of books about Marx and Hegel, Marx and Ricardo, Marx and Smith, etc. <clears throat> but if we go back to what David told us, he said that the last decade could be at least among his most creative period, then we also have to see who are the other thinkers with whom Marx is um, discussing from uh, whom Marx is learning. And Czerniszewski, who he met, he met and and you know fell in love before the, the the last years before 1881 1883 
but you know, he wrote Janiszewski, the critique of the philosophical prejudice against common ownership of the land in 1859. But Imani told us how essential is for Marx this, this book, this idea that you know you can skip. Uh, an intermediate stage that this only happens theoretically, but for example, as I try to, um, uh, you know, explain in the book, also translating some of these things for the first time because some of these authors were also often not known in English. But you know, in, um, thanks to the contact that uh, the backward nation had with the advanced nation, social phenomenon leaps directly from the lower to the higher level, avoiding intermediate stages along the way. So there is uh, um, a lot to learn for Marx, and this is also very different from the very well-known characterization of Marx ideas about history, in particular of his uh, unlucky preface of 1859 to the critique of political economy. Um, this is also in relation, Kevin, to your other um, very useful and important remark. So Russia as the basis, the, the, the debate discussion about Russia as the basis for other revolution, for revolution in other societies. I also agree there with you. And particularly, I think I agree with David with the fact that this ethnological notebooks, this anthropological studies of Marx deserve much more attention. And actually, this is something that you can read in uh, page one of my book in the, in the preface. I think I write, you know, I could not treat this. Um, hundreds of uh, essential, uh, very important pages written by Marx, because I'm trying to put together a 200 uh, pages book that is trying to be a biography, you know, theoretical work, and that is directed to a, um, a wider, a wide audience. So this is surely something where we can do more and study more in the coming years. In the way that David is doing, like providing a translation, providing an ontology so that people can read this Marx directly, like we have done before in the 20th century for other manuscripts of Marx, and then also to go through these documents and also trying to understand better Marx ideas and perhaps also some uh, problems that Marx had. And this is something that I want to now pass to you, to David, to Gavin. So these ideas that, you know, um, Marx is looking at these societies of the past as a, a good point where to find, um, you know, communal um, dimensions of uh, social life. Of course, I'm not talking about economic life because I try to make very, very clear in the book against all the third world readings of Marx that, that were very popular in the 70s in Japan, in Latin America, et cetera, that Marxist communism is something completely different from, I don't know, the pan-Slavic com uh, communism of Hertz and, and that this obscena, as Imani also told us, is something that cannot be taken as the model for communist society. So, um, I would like to hear more from you from this point of view, the way that Marx look and think about the potential of the ancient societies. And um, I also want to take the last minute to say that my book is also a lot, I'm grateful for what Kevin said about Marx's life, because I wanted to talk about what Marx did in his life and also the fact that when he went out Europe, outside Europe with his ideas, he also did that with his body. And for the first time he left Europe and he went in 1882 in Algeria, even though in a very, uh, very dramatical conditions before of his health. So I will conclude this by saying that with this Marx, with this manuscript that were, you know, represented and summarized so well by David, I think that we can go back to Marx differently from the past, not always only to look for answers, solutions, but it is very interesting to look at Marx's questions and the way he was asking questions, the way he was looking at society, the way he was trying to learn always more and on a more global perspective. 